This is Audible. Drink Deep by Chloe Neal. Chapter 10 The Mad Hatter's Tea Party. We lifted our hands into the air. We can hardly say no to such a sweet invitation, Jonah dryly said. The fairy dropped his sword just enough to allow us to pass, while the one behind us poked us in the back like cattle until we maneuvered in the door. Once in the tower, they shut and bolted the door again and took point beside us, katanas at the ready. I'm not sure what I should have expected to see in a fairy queen's abode in the top of a tower. Ancient dreary furnishings encased in a thick carpet of dust and spider silk? A broken mirror? A spinning wheel? The round room was larger than it should have been, given the narrowness of the tower, but it was tidy and decorated with simple hewn wooden furnishings. A canopy bed sat across the room, its round fluted columns wrapped in flowering vines that perfumed the air with scents of gardenias and roses. A giant table of rough-hewn, sun-bleached wood sat nearby. There were draperies of cornflower blue silk along the walls, but not a window to be seen. What I thought was a delicate chandelier hung from the ceiling. On closer reflection, I realized it was a cloud of monarch butterflies. There were no bulbs in the chandelier, but it glowed with a golden, ethereal light. And katanas weren't the only weapons in play. As I suddenly heard the echoing sound of a lullaby placed on an antique child's instrument, the pressure in the room changed. A panel of wispy fabric was moved aside on the canopy bed, and she emerged. The fairy queen was pale and voluptuous, with wavy strawberry blonde hair that fell past her shoulders. Her eyes were dusky blue, and she was barefoot dressed in a gauzy white gown that left nothing of her curvy form to the imagination. A crown of laurel leaves crossed her forehead, and a long, ornate locket of gold rested between her breasts. She walked toward us with shoulders back and an unmistakably regal bearing. I had the urge to genuflect, but wasn't sure of the etiquette. Was it appropriate for an enemy of the fairies, for a blood letter, to bow to their queen? She stopped a few feet away, and I felt the rush of dizziness again. I pushed it back and focused my attention on her face. She looked us over, and after a moment, raised her hand, palm out. That being their cue, the guards lifted their swords. And you are? she asked, a soft Irish lilt in her voice. Jonah, he said, of House Grey and merit of House Cadogan. She linked her hands together in front of her. It has been many years since we allowed blood letters to cross our threshold. Perhaps the riddles are not as strong as they once were. The magic not as concealing. The guardians not as careful. Her eyes darkened dangerously, and I decided I had no interest in crossing Claudia. We have need to speak to you, my lady. Jonah said, and those who offered the riddle of your location were well rewarded for it. For a moment I saw the same avarice, the same lust for gold in her eyes that I'd seen in the guards. Very well, then, she said. You are here to discuss contracts. It seems money is all vampires and fae have to speak about these years. We are not, he said. We are here to discuss events of late in the city. Ah, yes, she said with slow deliberation. She moved across the room to the table, then glanced back over her shoulder at me and Jonah. She was quite a sight to behold, like a character stripped from a fairy tale painting. The hidden fairy queen, equally ethereal and earthy, gazing back at the mortal with innocent invitation, beckoning him into her woods. I'd known women who used their sexuality to advantage. Selina, for one, was the type to entice men to do her bidding with overt sensuality. But Claudia ensnared men differently. 
The sensuality wasn't a tool. It was a fact. She had no reason to try to entice you. You would be enticed. And if you were, God help you. I couldn't imagine succumbing to the seductions of the Queen of Fae, accidentally or not, was a safe course of action. I looked at Jonah, wondering if he felt the pull. There was a general appreciation in his eyes, but when he looked at me, it was clear the gears were still turning. He gave me a nod. I have means at my disposal other than seduction, child, she said in a chiding tone and took a seat in one of the tall, weathered chairs at the table. We will speak of many things. But first, you will sit. You will join me for tea. I had a moment of panic. Didn't the myth say you were supposed to avoid any food or drink given to you by a fairy? My lady, Jonah carefully said, we have need of... Silence, she ordered the single word carrying enough power to lift the hair at the back of my neck. We will speak of these things in due time. If you ask a boon, you shall give a boon. Sit at my table, blood letters. Sit, and let us speak of pleasantries. It has been many moons since I have shared my hospitality with your kind. I wasn't thrilled about the delay, but I didn't think the two mean-looking mercenaries at the door would allow a slight. We would be honored to join you, I told her, and her laugh tinkled through the air. So she speaks, Claudia cannily said. I'm glad to know you are more than his guard and protector, child. As am I, I responded. As we walked to the table and took seats of our own, a silver platter full of food, crusty loaves of bread, piles of grapes, decanters of wine, appeared in the middle of it. The platter sat on a bed of tossed rose petals in the palest shades of pink and yellow, the colors barely discernible but undeniably there. I surveyed it suspiciously, and not just because she wanted a snack while the sky was burning around us. Claudia poured a silver goblet of wine for herself, then did the same for us. Drink deep, she said, for there's no enchantment in my hospitality. Had I permanent need of your company, I could most certainly assure it without such lures. She raised her dusky eyes to me and opened the door on the power she'd been holding in. There was a lot of it, and it wasn't nice. Claudia may have projected elfish sensuality, but the magic beneath the shell was cold, dark, primal, and greedy. Crossing her, I decided, was not a good strategy. You are wise, she said into the silence. I blushed at the intrusion into my thoughts, but held my peace. I was freaked out, however, that she could read minds. That was a trick no one had warned me about, and it certainly hadn't been mentioned in the canon. There was a siren in Lake Michigan. Tate had some sort of ancient power, and fairies could read minds. Maybe it was the English lit geek in me but I was reminded of a line from Hamlet. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Jonah reached forward and plucked a small plum from the platter. I opted for a grape nearly as big as the plum had been. Smaller fruit, less enchantment by volume, I figured. And credit where credit was due, it was the best grape I'd ever eaten. As sweet as a grape could be, with a flavor that sang of springtime and sunshine and sun-kissed skin. If this was enchantment, sign me up. Claudia glanced between me and Jonah. You are lovers, I think. We are friends, Jonah said, shifting a bit in his seat, unhappy with the admission. But you desire more, she countered. Awkwardness descended, and Jonah and I avoided eye contact. Claudia took a long drink of wine, then looked at me. You are hesitant, for you have lost your king. I caught Jonah's rueful expression out of the corner of my eye. The grape turned bitter in my mouth. The master of my house, I corrected. He was killed. I knew the true master of your house, Peter of Cadogan. 
He did a service for my folk, and he was rewarded in the manner of our people. He was given a jewel of great repute and fortune. It was nestled in the eye of a dragon. I'd seen that reward in Ethan's apartment. It was an enamel egg, around which was curled a sleeping dragon. The dragon's eye was a great, shining ruby. Ethan had kept the treasure in a glass case. The dragon's egg came to Ethan after Peter died. He treasured it. The memory tightened my gut, and I forced myself to keep talking, to keep the tears walled away. But I was told the egg was a gift to Peter Cadogan from Russian royalty. Claudia smiled faintly. The worlds of the Fey are not limited by human boundaries. We are royalty, regardless of our environs. King or Tsar, Queen or Tsarina. I have known many in my time. That must have been fascinating, Jonah said, but Claudia was unmoved. We care little for politics, for shifting of alliances and changing of guards. They do no service to longevity, to loyalty, to honor. She looked away, staring blankly across the room. As she did, the food on the table disappeared again, leaving only the scattering of rose petals behind. I reached out and traced my finger across one. I wasn't sure about the food, but the petal was definitely real. The lives of humans are transient, she said. You connect yourselves to them, and you can only expect the same of your own lives. That's why we're here, Jonah reminded her. I assume you know about the sky. I noticed he kept his tone light, carefully not mentioning the fact that my de facto master had sent us here to accuse Claudia of being behind the transformations. The sky is no concern of yours. It is when the sky is burning and humans believe vampires are responsible. And now the water has darkened for the second time. She arched a delicate eyebrow. The problems of humans have nothing to do with the sky, nor are they reflected there. Jonah and I stared a glance. Was she unaware? Had she not looked outside? Although now that I thought of it, I couldn't hear the crash of lightning in the tower. That was odd. I stole a glance at the guards and checked their expressions. A bit of guilt, I thought. Maybe a little malice. Maybe they dissuaded her from opening the door, shielded her from the happenings outside, not unlike Rapunzel in her tower. Milady, Jonah said, with all due respect, you may wish to look outside and see the world for yourself. The sky isn't normal, and we don't know why. There was indecision in her eyes, only for a second, but still there the debate whether to acknowledge a vampire and look foolish or refuse Jonah's request and risk discovering the same information later. It is not so easy as that, she said. I cannot look outside. The rules of your world do not apply here. Not to me. What rules? I wondered. She slid me a disdainful glance. I am an ancient one, child. I have lived more lifetimes than you can even conceive. But we are not an immortal race. I survive in my tower because I am protected here. Not unlike the portrait of Dorian Gray, I thought. That explained why she didn't know about the sky. Nevertheless, she said, I have companions to advise me of matters of which I should be aware. She offered a nasty look to the guards, then strode across the room to a table. She picked up a clear glass orb the size of a grapefruit and held it in front of her at chest height. She closed her eyes and began to murmur words beneath her breath. The language wasn't one I'd heard before, but the room filled again with dusty magic, the magic of ancient books and antique tapestries. Slowly, she released her hands, and the sphere floated in the air in front of her, spinning slowly on an invisible axis. She opened her eyes again and watched it spin. Whatever she saw there, she didn't like it. Her eyes widened, and she let out a banshee-esque scream.
the spell broken, the globe hit the floor and shattered into a spill of glass. The sky is bleeding, she said, then flipped her head around, strawberry locks framing her face to glare at her guards. They cowered at her murderous expression. I have seen it, she said. I have seen the bleeding sky, the dark water. The city drips of elemental magic, and you thought not to tell me. The guards looked at each other. My lady, one quietly began. We only just learned, and we didn't want to concern you. You didn't want to concern me. We are the sky folk. We master the moon and sun. You didn't think I should be called upon? My stomach fell, and not just from the burgeoning magic in the room. This was our third attempt to contact the supernatural dots, and we still hadn't managed to do it. Not only had the fairies not caused the sky to change, the queen hadn't even known about it. My lady, began the other guard, but Claudia held up a hand. She closed her eyes, her expression pained. Is she unspelling it? I whispered, hope rising in my chest. Jonah shook his head. I don't think so. After a moment, she opened her eyes. There was a time when the Fae were free to roam, Claudia said, before magic was forbidden. When the world was green. The world is no longer green, and I am relegated to my tower. Those years have passed, and the Fae hardly remember the shape of the green world. They become entangled in human drama, just as you do. They believe they know how to survive. Am I no less to blame? The world moves slowly here, and on occasion I forget the meadow and the field. Without ceremony, she strode across the room to the guards, the gauzy fabric shushing against the stone with each step. She reached the first guard, the man, took his katana in hand, and before I could even grip the handle of my sword, she whipped it through the air. A long red line of crimson appeared at the guard's neck. You have failed me, she hoarsely said. The scent of fey blood flowed across the room, and my eyes rolled back at the temptation of it. However much I might have enjoyed blood of the bagged and vampire varieties, the hunger they inspired was nothing compared to the scent, from across the room, of a few droplets of fairy blood. My fangs descended. I struggled to retain control over my hunger, to avoid leaping across the room and jumping onto the bleeding fairy for a snack. Thanks to Frank's restrictions, I'd had barely any blood in the last few days and my hunger roared back to life. I squeezed my fingers around the hilt of my katana until my nails began to bite into my palm, confident that if I lost control, we'd lose the fairies, and possibly our lives. You defy your queen, Claudia told him, and you will bear the scar of it. She dropped the sword to the floor, where it bounced and clanked, steel against stone, and finally came to rest a drop of crimson hanging from the finely honed edge. Claudia moved to the female guard, pulled away her sword, and repeated the act, the air now doubly permeated with blood and magic. I shivered in anticipation. Jonah, Merritt, he gritted out. Hold it in. But his voice was hoarse, and when I looked, I saw that his eyes were silver as well. Had no one known about this reaction? Had no one thought to warn us that if mercenary fairies bled, when violence was in their names, we'd be in trouble? The second sword hit the ground, and both fairies stood bleeding, their queen before them, the instruments of their wrath on the ground. You, too, will bear the scar, she said, for refusing to remember that I, and I alone, am your queen to whom you owe all fealty. You do not make decisions for the Fae. Her words rose to a crescendo. The guards dropped to the floor as the power in the room rose. I fought back the urge to cower, the hunger for blood too strong. I took a step, that first step taken, the second, third, and fourth were easier, 
and I was nearly to the fairies, and the scent was delectable. Merit, no! Jonah called out my name, but I crossed the room so quickly that the fairy had no time to react, only to struggle in my arms as I moved in for a bite. I was there and at his throat, my teeth bared and ready to strike, and it wasn't an insult or a threat or a risk to his life. It was flattery, a compliment to the blood that coursed through his veins, liquid gold in its worth, but Claudia would have none of it. Blood letter, she cried, and without warning, I was in the air and flying across the room. I hit the stone wall behind me with energy enough to force the air from my lungs and the bloodlust from my body. My head wrung, my body aching, chest heaving with the effort of pulling in air. I put a hand on the floor and just managed to raise my head enough to see her striding toward me. You dare to seek the blood of the Fae in my home, in my tower? Claudia was furious, her eyes black with it and she strode toward me with such anger there was little doubt about what she'd do when she reached me. But then she was blocked from view. Jonah stepped between us, his katana outstretched. You touch her, and I will strike you down. The repercussions be damned. If I hadn't already been on the ground, you could have knocked me over with a feather. You defy me, blood letter. I defy anyone who would seek to harm her. We have advised you of things no one else would, and you have had your fun with us. We leave you here with the scales balanced. And besides, she is a blood letter, and that makes her kith and kin to me. You would do the same, have done the same, to protect your own. My head was reeling with the truth of that one. She attacked my guard, Claudia persisted because you baited her with blood and violence, and you attacked her in kind. We are even. As master of the sky, you will see it is just. Silence, and then a nod. I will spare your life on this day, because you speak the truth. Let it be recorded that I have no quarrel with you or yours. The deal struck. Jonah reached out a hand to me, and when I took it, he pulled me to my feet. Every bone and muscle ached, and the room was still spinning, although I wasn't sure if that was an aftershock of the bloodlust, the throw, or the magic that still peppered the room. He scanned my face for injuries. You okay? I'm fine. Heed this, blood letters, Claudia said. There was no enchantment. The sky is not turned because someone wished it because someone spelled it for revenge or love or power. If you look to the sky, you see the symptom, not the effect. And what caused this symptom, Jonah said. That would be a question for those who did it, eh? As I'd seen with the guards, Jonah was kind, but not especially patient. So I stepped in. Do you have any idea who that might have been? The humans are growing restless, and the mayor seeks to punish us for transgressions that aren't our own. The punishment of blood letters is no interest of mine. More than vampires are affected, Jonah persisted. The lake pulled magic from others in the city, from the nymphs, from the sorcerers. It was dangerous and created trouble for everyone. I am queen of the fey blood letter, not a waif who seeks the blood of others to survive. I have knowledge of sky and mastery over it. I have legions of fey at my command and Valkyrie to ride with them. Do not dare to tell me what is and is not dangerous. She sighed and strolled back to the table where she took a seat. The sky has not been burned by me or mine. There is magic on the wind, old magic, ancient magic and we will not stand aside while that magic destroys the world. My heart began to beat again. That was a clue I could work with. Meaning? Jonah asked. Claudia smiled grimly. Meaning we would destroy meadow and field ourselves before allowing for its piecemeal destruction. You can't destroy the city because you don't like the direction it's taking. If we destroy the city... 
It is only because that destruction is inevitable and we seek a merciful inferno over a moldering decay. Leave now, she said, rising from the table and walking back to her bed and sitting upon it. I have tired of you. The guards moved toward us, malice in their eyes. I had offended their queen, and it was time to pay up. But Claudia spoke again before we could move. Vampires. We looked back. The city is unbalanced, she said. Water and sky reveal that imbalance. If you are to save it, you must do this. Find the illness and return the balance. Her eyes turned cold and dark again. For if you do not, then we must. And I submit you will not like our cure. I had no doubt she was right. Chapter 11 Dear John We made it out the door and down the steps, my head pounding, but the body ache nearly gone. Some nights it did pay to be a quickly healing vampire, very angst notwithstanding. The blood-red sky was now dotted with angry storm clouds, and lightning still flashed in great glowing arcs. Not thrilled about being its target, we decided to debrief in my car. We walked through the chill air and damp grass and back to my Volvo. We moved silently, the air between us charged by what he'd done and my mixed feelings about it. It was definitely good to be alive, but I had a bad track record with self-sacrifice. Ethan had stepped in front of a stake meant for me because he'd had feelings for me. Had Jonah done the same? I decided to focus on my dangerous actions instead of his heroic ones. I am so sorry, I told him when we climbed inside. Frank's rationing blood, but even beyond that, the hunger was overpowering. I've never felt anything that strong. Even my first hunger, during which I'd launched myself at Ethan, hadn't been that bad. The guard had come a lot closer to being fang-marked. The receiver cut back on your blood supplies? Is he trying to incite riots? Or make us go crazy and attack the first supernaturals in sight? Mission accomplished, Jonah said. If vampires have always reacted that way to fairy blood, it explains why fairies don't like us any more than humans. It does, he agreed, and it explains why they keep their distance and why we have to pay them so much to guard the house. That kind of power is dangerous. Unfortunately, it doesn't really help us with the bigger issue. Figuring out what the hell is going on? That's the one. Claudia mentioned a couple of times that she didn't think this was about the sky or water per se, but that they were symptoms of a larger problem. I nodded, and I think she had something else there. She accused the guards of not telling her about elemental magic. What if she meant it literally? What do you mean? So far, we've seen water and sky affected. Water and air, I repeated, and watched understanding dawn in his expression. Water, air, earth, fire, he said. The four elements. Exactly. We've seen two so far. If she was right about these things being symptoms, then someone is working magic with elemental effects, Jonah finished. I wasn't entirely sure what that meant or who might be doing it, but my gut told me we were on the right track. And after the week we'd had, I'd take any victory I could get. She also blamed ancient magic, Jonah said. Old magic. Any theories on who that might be? Actually, yeah. What do you know about Tate? Seth Tate? He shrugged. I know it's believed he has magic, that you felt it before, but that no one knows what magic it is. Why? Because when I visited him, I had a sense of something old, a different kind of magic, closer to what I felt from Claudia than what I've seen of vampires. Okay. But this is the third time we've approached a supernatural group thinking they might have initiated the problem. We've been wrong all three times. I know, our batting average sucks. But like she said, we've been looking at the symptoms, not the cause. Besides, we have to try something. 
If we can't tie this to a supernatural working magic, then what else would there be? Radiation? A new kind of weapon? Global warming? If no SUPs are doing this on purpose, is it accidental magic of some kind? I thought about Lorelei's prediction that too many shifters in town were doing just that, accidentally throwing off the world's balance. On the other hand, she'd blamed shifters when the water had been the only problem. This time, we had water and air. If Claudia is right, he said, and this is about some deeper imbalance in the city, maybe the key isn't the who, it's the what. What kind of magic would be powerful enough to screw up both water and air? Sorcerers? I can vouch for Catcher and Mallory. He's exhausted from working on this problem, and she's wrapped up in her exams. Besides, even asking them about it would make them both go ballistic. And I didn't need any more ballistic right now. I was actually thinking about the only order-sanctioned sorcerer in town. You're talking about Simon? I asked. To tell you the truth, when I asked him about the water, he seemed to be in denial about the whole thing. A little shady, yeah, but largely in denial. This could be a cover for some kind of secret magic he's working, but I didn't have the sense of it. And if you're the only sanctioned sorcerer in town, you're already the big man on campus. Why risk that? What's the benefit? The prize? Be that as it may, we don't have much else to go on. It might pay at least to sit him down and talk to him about it. See what information he or the Order can provide. Good point. I'll see if Catcher can set it up. A bolt of lightning crashed nearby, shaking the car. We both looked out the windows and up at the sky, clouds whirling across it. If this is a symptom, I said, a side effect... Maybe we can find its heart? He looked over at me. What do you mean? The effect on the river stopped at the city limits, right? So it's unlikely the sky is red everywhere. And if there are boundaries, maybe there's also a center, an origin point. Like a giant sucking tornado in the middle of the loop? Hopefully not that, but that's the idea, yeah. If we can't find the people responsible for this... Maybe we can find their location. We can drive through different neighborhoods to see if there's a focus. And we'll cover more territory if we split up. If we find something, we can rally at that place. That sounds like a decent plan, Jonah said, but he made no move to get out of the car. Was he waiting on me to say something about what had happened in the tower? To offer thanks, or maybe vitriol? I silently swore and reminded myself that the point was what he'd done, not why he'd done it. And thanks, by the way, for defending me. You're welcome, he said. It's part and parcel of being someone's partner. We aren't partners yet, I reminded him, thinking of the Red Guard. Aren't we? He gazed back at me, and it was clear he wasn't thinking of the RG, but had something much more fundamental in mind. His eyes changed, and then his hand was behind my head, and he was leaning toward me, pulling me toward him. And before I could stop him, his lips were on mine, his mouth insistent. Jonah kissed me with the intimacy of a lover and the confidence of a challenger to the throne, daring me to think outside the box I'd walled around me. And for a moment, I let him. It felt so good to be wanted, to be needed to be desired by someone again. It hadn't been all that long since Ethan had been gone, but Ethan and I hadn't been together long, if at all. And the kiss was just toe-curling. Jonah wasn't a novice, and he used every part of his body to his advantage. His fingers at my jaw, his tongue teasing mine, his body moving closer and closer, a suggestion of things he could offer. Warmth, the solace of touch, another kind of intimacy. But a shock of guilt turned my stomach. I wasn't ready. I pulled back and turned away, covering my mouth with a hand. It had only been a kiss, not initiated by me, 
and certainly no violation of any promise I'd made. But my lips were swollen, and my skin was flushed, and there was a ball of heat in the pit of my stomach. However unexpected it may have been, and however long Ethan may have been gone, my reaction felt like a betrayal to his memory. You're not ready, he quietly said. I'm not. I'm sorry, but I'm not. His next words surprised me nearly as much as the kiss had. No, I'm sorry, he said. I shouldn't have pushed. It's just, I didn't expect this. I didn't expect to find a connection. I looked back at him again, my heart racing at the desire in his eyes and the sudden sense of panic that tightened my chest. I am flattered, really, but... I he held up a hand and smiled gently. You don't have to apologize. I took a chance, and the timing isn't right. No harm, no foul. He cleared his throat, then nodded confidently. Let's just forget the temporary humiliation and get back to work. You're sure? I'm sure, he said with a nod and pulled out his phone, a shiny gold wafer, to check in with Scott Gray. I did the same and sent a message to Kelly, advising her that we hadn't discovered anything helpful and that Claudia apparently hadn't even known about the sky. Her response chilled me. Protesters doubled because of sky, all vamps on guard, extra ferries at gate, National Guard called, humans believe apocalypse imminent, was the immediate follow-up. I muttered a curse. What? Jonah quietly asked, but I held up a hand while I typed out a response to Kelly. Return home? I asked her, or keep looking. Crisis being managed, she responded. Keep looking. I could definitely keep looking. It was the finding that was proving difficult. The message sent, I tucked the phone away again and updated Jonah. Humans think the end is near, I told him. The protesters at Cadogan House have doubled again. Alarm flashed in his eyes. Do we need to get back? Kelly says she's on it and wants us to keep looking. Do you think you could have Scott make a call? Maybe send some guards over? He answered without hesitation, sending an immediate message on his phone. Done, he said after a moment, pushing the phone away again. Scott is advised. Greyhouse is quiet, and he'll contact Kelly and offer up some friends. Cadogan House didn't have any alliances with other houses in Chicago. Maybe we could make an ally of Greyhouse, even if the circumstances weren't ideal. I'll go back to the loop. I'll search there for something that looks like a focus, and I'll stick close to the water in case there's some link we don't know about between the water and sky. Why don't you drive around this part of town? Hit the rest of the Gold Coast and Jackson Park. Call me if you find anything. He nodded. Sure, he said, then climbed out of my car and into his. I felt awkward leaving him after the kiss, but what else could I do? There was only so much a girl could accomplish in a night. Once I was on my way to the loop, I turned the heat to maximum. Even though I'd felt a little claustrophobic in the tower, there was something weirdly soothing about cranking the heat on a cold night. There had been cold nights during grad school, nights when Mallory had been late at work or on a date with some law firm or financial services cutie, when I'd taken a study break by climbing into my car and driving across the city. I knew which roads had less traffic and relatively few lights, and I'd use the drive to zone out, to forget myself to forget everything except the road in front of me. Occasionally, I'd bring along an audiobook, the twelfth or thirteenth installment in some long-running mystery or action series I couldn't seem to stop buying, even as the books became formulaic copies of the ones that came before. I'd crank up the sound just as I had the heat, and I'd drive across Chicago, sometimes into Indiana, sometimes into Wisconsin sometimes into the Illinois countryside, to have a little time away. This, of course, wasn't one of those times. I didn't have time for a joyride, 
and the trip wasn't relaxing. The city was still filled with groups of people huddled on sidewalks or porches, staring tentatively up at the sky, taking pictures with cell phones and cameras. There was no way Crisis in Chicago wasn't the lead story on every news station in the country, especially if the National Guard was involved. They'd all be looking for some reason for the sky and water, and I had absolutely nothing to offer them. I wish I had the answers they were looking for. I crossed the river, the gleaming inky black slice of it, and drove back into the loop. The buildings were tighter here, but the sky seemed as red as it had at Potter Park. The lightning strikes just as frequent. No more, no less. Damn, I quietly muttered. It was probably one of the few times anyone other than a meteorologist or storm chaser had rued the absence of a giant sucking tornado, as Jonah had put it, in a populated area. But it would have given me an answer. And those were few and far between these days. Instead, there were questions. Questions about me. Questions about sorcerers. Questions about the house and its staff. Questions about the city and whether they trusted us to live our own lives without our constant reassurances that we meant them no harm. After what I'd seen tonight, a fairy queen willingly scarring those who worked for her because they hadn't brought issues to her attention fast enough, maybe they were right. Maybe we shouldn't be trusted. God, I was beginning to depress myself. Without any better option, I pulled over into a parking space and turned off the car. The city was relatively quiet, but the night still carried a quiet buzz. There was an energy in Chicago. Even if we weren't the city that didn't sleep, we certainly were the city that never rested. Thinking a katana was a little too lightning rod for my taste, I unbuckled the sword and left it in the car. Humans were already afraid of us. There was no point in riling them up when we had other problems to address. I was a block from State Street, so I walked over to it, sticking close to the edge of the buildings while looking for anything that might be amiss. The streets were relatively empty except for bar hoppers and folks scanning the sky for meteors or aliens or some other explanation for its color. I followed State to the river, noting the strange tingle of its increasingly powerful magical vacuum, and walked across the bridge, stopping in the middle to take a look. The river stretched out in front and behind me, a frozen black artery through downtown. The sky was uniformly red above. Heavy clouds also tainted red by... whatever. The side effect of some curse? Some ancient charm? Some bitter hex? Unfortunately, I had no clue. If there was a focus, I hadn't found it. Nothing seemed any different out here. There were no sorcerers casting spells upon the sky. No fire-breathing dragons. Tate, as far as I was aware, hadn't escaped into the loop to transfix us all with his strange magic. While none of those developments would have been exactly welcome, at least they would have been developments, hints of answers. I walked back toward my car, pausing at a bus stop and sitting down on the empty bench. The city was undergoing natural disasters with no obvious cause, and apparently these were the only symptoms of some larger issue. How was I supposed to figure this out? Vampires could sense magic, but only if it was really close by. This was way beyond my expertise. I needed a diviner. The witches who walked around with forked branches and searched out hidden springs. Except, I needed one for magic. I sat up straight and pulled out my phone. And since he was the closest thing to a water witch I had, I dialed up Catcher. You're still alive. Last time I checked, and here's a fact to add to your database. Fairy blood turns vampires batshit crazy. I heard the creak of his chair as he sat up. You shed fairy blood? Actually, no. Claudia, the queen, got irritated with her guards. They hadn't filled her in on the sky yet. He made a low whistle. Since the sky is still red, I assume the fairies weren't the problem. They were not. 
That's three strikes. The water sups didn't mess with the water. The sky sups didn't mess with the sky. Claudia thinks we're seeing the effects of a larger magical problem with elemental magic as the visible symptoms. I heard his sigh through the phone. Elemental magic, he said. I should have put two and two together. I should have thought about that. My heart raced. Were we getting somewhere? Did he have an answer? Does that mean something to you? It gives the magic context. It shows the pattern. Is there a group, a species, a person who uses that pattern? Not specifically, but it proves that magic is involved. I rolled my eyes. Hadn't we already figured out magic was involved? Jonah's suggestions notwithstanding, it seemed unlikely humans had simply flipped a switch that had turned the sky red and sent lightning crashing across it. As if irritated by the thought, a bolt of lightning suddenly struck a car three blocks down the street. Its car alarm began to chirp in warning. I huddled back into the bus stop, wishing I was already back in my car. I hated lightning. I don't suppose you have any better sense of what Tate might be. Claudia kept mentioning old magic, and that's the sense I get from him. Old magic wouldn't surprise me, Catcher said, although that's not a magical classification per se. That his magic feels old doesn't signal what he is or who he might be. Of course it didn't. That would be too easy. Then we need to work that angle and figure it out. Can you get me in to see him again? Catcher whistled. Since our office has been officially disbanded, we aren't exactly on the approved visitors list for the secret facility holding our ex-mayor. We may be able to pull some strings, but that'll take time. Do what you can. I'm getting nowhere fast. Although there was one group I could look into. I know this question is going to hurt, but I need an answer regardless. What about the order? I gnawed my lip in anticipation of a snarky response. But that's not what I got back. Catcher had changed his tune. I've been racking my brain, he said, and I could hear that in the hoarse exhaustion in his voice. But I can't come up with any way they're involved. I just don't know what advantage they'd see in doing this. They may be naive, but they aren't evil. What about Simon? I don't know how Simon spends his days, Merritt, other than monopolizing all of Mallory's time and every ounce of her mental energy. She seems to be the number one focus of his attention. Besides, he's king of the city right now. Why cause trouble? I had the same thought. Keep your people calm and off Simon's radar. He may seem mild-mannered, but he's still a fully trained member of the Order and vampire interference will only piss him off. Let me look into it. I'll stall, I warned, but Frank's antsy, and you know the kind of pressure he's putting on Malik. Humans are freaking out, and the National Guard is on its way to Catagon House. Whoever is involved in this, we need evidence, and we need it fast. I'll handle it. Where are you, anyway? I decided not to tell him I was hunched in a bus stop on State Street because I didn't have any better ideas. I'm playing Sentinel, I told him. Give me a call as soon as you have something. Catcher grunted his agreement, and the phone went dead. I tucked it away again and looked out into the night. Noise began to roll down the street as a parade of humans dressed in white clothes walked toward me. They carried white poster board signs announcing the apocalypse and recommending Bible passages for immediate consideration. The warnings were scrawled in blood-red paint, drips marking the edges of the letters. They'd painted signs in a hurry, frantic to make a difference before it was too late. Before vampires destroy the world, I quietly muttered. The humans might be right about the end of the world. That wasn't exactly information I was privy to. But I was pretty confident they'd have more than words for me if they caught me out here alone. So I hunkered back into the corner and watched as they passed. A Greek chorus warning of the coming tragedy. A few minutes later, they disappeared from view and the street was quiet again. I stood up and stretched my legs. But just as I prepared to leave the bus stop, 
a streak of white lightning shot across the sky and rain began to pour down in heavy sheets. Of course it would rain, I muttered. I stood in the doorway of the bus stop for another few moments, rain splashing onto my boots, waiting for a break in the downpour and wishing, once again, that Ethan had been here with me. He'd know what to do, have some plan of attack in mind. I knew this burden was mine to bear. I just hoped I had the brawn to carry it and the brains to figure it out. As quickly as it had begun, the rain slowed and stopped. As I stepped onto the street, I caught scents of water and city and sulfur, but there was something else. The smells of lemon and sugar, the same scents I'd caught around Tate. Claudia thought the magic was old, and now the rain smelled like Tate? That couldn't just be coincidence. Dawn was approaching, but I knew exactly where I needed to go tomorrow night. Hopefully my grandfather's name still carried some cachet, and they'd be able to get me in to see Tate again. Still afraid of the lightning, I sprinted back to my car, my skin buzzing from the ozone in the air. I'd only managed to put the key in the lock when the barrel of a gun was pushed against my cheek. Hello, Merritt, McKettrick said pleasantly. Long time no see. Chapter 12 Happiness is a Warm Gun I looked down at the dark, cold steel now pointed at my chest. The weapon was longer and stockier than a handgun, closer in shape to a sawed-off shotgun with a single wide barrel. I glanced up. McKettrick smiled smugly. He was a handsome man, with short dark hair, sculpted cheekbones, and a body that wouldn't quit. His eyes were wide and exotic-looking, but his mouth was twisted with cruelty, and there was a new scar across his upper lip that hadn't been there the last time I'd seen him. Hands in the air, please, he pleasantly said. For the second time in a night, I lifted my hands into the air. Ironic, wasn't it, that I'd left my sword in the car so I wouldn't scare off any humans? And here he was pointing a gun at my chest. McKettrick, I said by way of greeting. Could you move that gun, please? When it's so effective at getting your attention, I don't think so. And in case you have any thought of taking a shot for the good of the cause, or using a new variety of bullet, something a little less iron and steel, something a little bit woodier, a new process that combines the shock of a bullet with the chemical reaction of aspen, it's proven very effective. A chill ran through me. If he'd managed to turn aspen wood, the one thing that shot through the heart of a vampire would turn us to dust, into bullets, and he knew it was effective. How many vampires had died in the testing? Is that how you got the scar? I wondered aloud. His upper lip curled. I am none of your concern. You are when you've got a gun pointed at me, I said, and mulled my options. Trying to knock the gun from his hand with a well-timed kick might be successful, but he was former military and undoubtedly skilled at hand-to-hand. -hand. Besides, the might carried a pretty high risk that I'd take a sliver of aspen to the heart and end up a cone of ashes. There was also a pretty solid chance he had minions waiting in the wings with similar weapons. There'd been too much death lately, so I quickly decided playing martyr wasn't an option. Instead, I opted to gather what information I could. I'm surprised you're out tonight, I told him. Shouldn't you be warning folks about the apocalypse? Or maybe hanging out with the mayor? We saw you at the press conference. She's a woman with a plan for the city. She's a moron who's easily manipulated. He smiled. Your words, not mine. Although she certainly has proved receptive to my position on vampires. So I've seen. I assume you're one of the brains behind the registration law. I'm not a fan, he said. Really? It seemed like keeping close tabs on our activities would be right up your alley. That's only short-term thinking, Merritt. If you allow supernatural aberrations to register themselves, you condone their existence. 
He shook his head like a lecturing pastor. No, thank you. That's a step in the wrong direction. I wasn't really eager to hear what McKettrick thought the right direction for the city might be, but he didn't afford me the luxury of his silence. There's only one solution for the city, cleaning it out, ridding it of vampires. That solves the apocalypse problem. In order to clean up the city, we need a catalyst. If we rid the city of a vampire who's known to the public, we might be able to make some headway. My stomach sank. McKettrick wasn't just looking to kick vamps out of the city. He wanted to exterminate them, starting with me. With the gun pointed at me, I didn't have a lot of options. I couldn't grab my cell phone, and calling out for humans within hearing range would only put them in the line of fire. I couldn't take that risk. With my increased vampire strength, I might be able to best McKettrick in hand-to-hand -hand combat but he rarely traveled alone. He usually came with a pack of equally brawny guys in unrevealed black, and although I hadn't seen them yet, I couldn't imagine they weren't out there waiting for me. So I opted to use one of my best talents, stubbornness. What exactly do you think taking me out is going to accomplish? You're only going to piss off vampires and incite humans who don't want murder in their city. McKettrick looked hurt by the accusation. That's incredibly naive. Sure, there may be a few in Chicago who don't realize the breadth of the vampire problem. But that's what this is all about. People need something to rally around, Merritt. You're the rallying point. You mean the ashes all become? You know that's all that will be left, right? A cone of ashes there on the sidewalk. I gestured down at the concrete below us. It's not as if you'll be standing over the dead body of a fallen vampire. Believe me, I've seen it. I said a silent prayer of apology to Ethan's memory for my callousness, but given the twitch in McKettrick's jaw, I kept going. It'll look more like you emptied a vacuum cleaner than staked a vampire, and that's not exactly going to make great television. You aren't even on the front lines. What is that supposed to mean? It means there's a mess of humans outside Cadogan House right now protesting our existence, and the National Guard is on its way. Why aren't you out there with them, getting to know them, recruiting like-minded souls? Oh, I said, nodding my head. I get it. You don't really like people any more than you like vampires. You just like playing the hero, or what you imagine to be a hero. I personally don't think genocide is terribly heroic. He slapped me across the cheek, hard enough to make my head ring, and I immediately tasted blood. I will not, he menacingly said, stepping even closer to me. Let some little fanged bitch turn me from my mission. My anger, aided by my knife-edged hunger, began to spread through my limbs in a gloriously warm rush that pushed the chill from my bones. Your mission? Your mission is murder, McKettrick, plain and simple. Let's not forget that. And I'd reckon that what you know about me, or vampires, would fit on the head of a pin. Check the sky, he said, pushing the barrel of the gun into my chest. You think that doesn't have something to do with you? Actually, it has nothing to do with us, I told him but spared him the details about the other groups it might have had something to do with. There was no point in putting them on McKettrick's radar, too. How could it not have something to do with you? What else could be responsible for this? Global warming? I suggested. Have you recycled today? That earned me a punch in the stomach that put me on the wet ground on my knees. I coughed a little, exaggerating the injury. It had definitely hurt, but not that bad. I think he pulled his punch a little at the end. Maybe punching a fanged bitch was harder than giving her a good slap across the face. His thinking I was more delicate than I actually was only worked to my advantage. You're a sadist, I spat out. No, he patiently said. I'm a realist. You make me violent. You make me fight a war I shouldn't have to fight. 
Blaming the victim is so last year, I told him. I braced for a kick, but nothing came. Instead, he crouched down on his knees, his brows furrowed in concern. You don't understand. I do. You're an egotist, and you think you know more than anyone else in Chicago. But really, McKetrick, you're an ignorant coward. You're fighting to take away our rights, and we're the ones trying to solve the problem. Your ego has blinded you. I feel sorry for you, actually. That apparently was the end of his patience. He stood up again, stuck two fingers in his mouth, and whistled. Two men in black fatigues ran toward us. One pointed another wide-barreled shotgun at me, while the other wrenched me to my feet and pulled my arms behind my back. I cursed him loudly and stomped on his foot, but McKetrick's barrel at my chin was a pretty good deterrent for more violence. Put her in the vehicle, McKetrick said. We'll take her back to the facility. Seeing the facility would definitely help me close McKetrick's operations, but it seemed unlikely I'd ultimately survive the visit. Getting into that car was a death sentence, so I fought with all my might. I squirmed in the goon's arms, and as he struggled to keep me upright, shifted my weight and kicked out at McKetrick's gun. It flew from his hand. He immediately went after it. The goon's grip loosened in the chaos, and with a quick back kick to the jewels and a low roundhouse that connected squarely, I put him flat on his back. That's one of my favorite moves, I told him, thinking of a conversation Ethan and I'd had. Too bad I was fighting this one solo. Get her, McKetrick said, having plucked up the gun a few feet away and began walking back to me, arms outstretched. I turned to run and ran squarely into goon number two. I looked up at him, smiled a little, and offered another below-the-belt kick. This one was smart enough to anticipate the move. He blocked it, but he wasn't the first man who'd blocked one of my kicks. I ducked a punch, and while I was down, pounded a fist into his shin. When he hopped in pain, I jumped up and executed a picture-perfect crescent kick that put him on the ground. That was two goons on the ground with well-executed kicks but I didn't even have time to enjoy the victory before a jab to my kidney put me on the ground again. I looked behind me. McKetrick stood there, gun outstretched, arms shaking with obvious fury. I have had it with you, he said, trigger finger shaking. After being beaten down by Selena on another rainy night, I'd made a promise to myself. So I stood up and gazed back at him forcing myself to look calm and locking my legs so they didn't tremble. If you're going to stake me, I told him, you'll do it while looking me in the eye. I prepared myself for the shock, to feel the sharp sting of splinters if he happened to miss my heart, or to lose myself completely if his aim was true. I was brave enough to admit that either end was a possibility. He extended the gun toward my chest, just above my heart. I tried one final ploy. I appreciate this, you know. I watched him fight the urge, but he was still asked the question. Appreciate what? What you're doing. I took a minuscule step forward, pushing my chest into the muzzle of the gun, making me a martyr. I mean, I get that you'll have to make up some tale about how I tried to hurt you and you saved the city of Chicago from me. I lowered my voice a bit. But the supernaturals will know, McKetrick. The vampires, the shifters, they like me, and they won't believe you. I stood up on tiptoes and looked him in the eye. They'll find you. Funny thing about anger. It could help you, or it could hurt you. It could ruin your composure and make you blink. McKetrick blinked. You bitch, he said, teeth gritted. I will not let you ruin this city. The gun wavered, shaking in his hand just a bit. I took the opportunity, striking up beneath the gun and pushing it out of his hand. It flew through the air and skittered across the concrete. 
he dived for it. I could give credit where credit was due. McKetrick was bigger and brawnier than me, but I was faster. I got there before he did, scraped fingers against asphalt to ensure the gun was safely in hand, and by the time he reached me, turned it on him. His eyes widened. You're ruining this city. Yeah, you said that. I'd like to point out, though, that vamps aren't pulling over civilians and threatening them, nor are we pointing guns in their faces. He growled, spit out a few more curses, and moved to his knees. Does this make you feel powerful? With me down on my knees before you like some sycopanthic human? No. And you know why not? I gave him a pistol whipping to the temple that put him on the ground and knocked him out cold. Because I'm not you. I closed my eyes for just a moment, just a moment to breathe, and then opened them again at the sound of squealing tires. I looked back. The two goons had disappeared, and the black SUV was peeling down the street. So much for loyalty, I muttered, but then looked down at McKetrick and around the neighborhood. The bus stop was a few yards away, but the eastern sky was beginning to lighten. I didn't have much time, so I was going to need backup. Lightning still flashing around us, I dragged McKetrick to the bus stop and propped him up against the bench. I pulled out my phone. Catcher answered with the question, What do you want, Merritt? The entire house was testy this week and I was beginning to reach the end of my patience with the Bell Carmichael clan. Still, I had work to do. I gave him my address. If you can get here fast enough, you'll find McKetrick in the bus stop, out cold. McKetrick? he asked, his voice suddenly suffused with a lot less snark. What happened? He and two of his goons surprised me in the loop. Same song and dance about hating vampires and wanting them out of Chicago. But with a really bad twist, he has, or at least claims to have, Aspen bullets. I managed to grab one of his guns, but not his goons, who took off. He also mentioned he has some kind of facility. I'm hoping he'll give you some details. That would be helpful. You interested in pressing charges against him for assault and battery? Only if it's necessary to keep him locked up. Shouldn't be, Catcher said. If you'll recall, we're no longer affiliated with the city. This is just a couple of guys having a friendly conversation off the record. Funny how the Constitution is no longer an issue. Maybe not, but that didn't mean my grandfather couldn't still end up in hot water for kidnapping. That's your call, but I don't know how long he's going to be out. And since the city's going to start stirring pretty soon, you might want to give Detective Jacobs a heads up. You don't want a random CPD uniform finding him before you get here. Jacobs knew my grandfather and had interrogated me after a dose of V, the drug tape manufactured for vampires, had turned the Cadogan House bar into a deadly mosh pit. Jacobs was cautious and detail-oriented, and he was honestly on the side of truth and justice. There weren't a lot of people like that around anymore, so I deemed him an ally. I'll float the idea to Chuck to see which direction he wants to take. I know he wants to stay on the good side of the CPD, but there's something to be said for testing this newfound freedom the mayor has given us. I heard the sounds of shuffling. We're leaving now, he added. Should be there in twenty. It's nearly dawn, so I'm heading back to the house. And speaking of your newfound freedom, any luck arranging a second meeting with Tate? I'm working on it. I'm cashing in the political capital we've got. But the bureaucrats are greedy. Gowalczyk made them nervous. I'll let you know tomorrow night. I would appreciate it. Hey, while I've got you on the phone, have you ever smelled anything weird around Tate? I make it a habit not to smell politicians or convicts. I'm serious. Whenever I'm around him, I smell lemon and sugar. And a little while ago, after the downpour, I smelled it again, like there was some sort of similar magic flowing from the rain, like he'd been involved in it somehow. We got a little rain out here, but I didn't smell anything. I wouldn't put a lot of stock in smells. 
Besides, Tate's locked up. What could he do? So he said. I knew there was something in it, but I let it go. Take care. Be gentle with our soldier. Not that he deserves it, Catcher said, and he hung up the call. The edge of the sky now searing yellow, I put the phone away again and left McKetrick in his bus stop, looking like a party-goer who'd had a little too much fun. Lucky him. Chapter 13 The best part of waking up is type A in your cup. I called Kelly on the way to give her an update about McKetrick and reached the house a bit too close to dawn for comfort. I ran from my car into the house, only barely realizing in my sun-fed exhaustion that the protesters had quieted. No doubt thanks to the two dozen camouflaged members of the National Guard who stood at equal points around the fence. I immediately headed upstairs to fall into bed but stopped at the second-floor landing and cast a glance at the third floor above me. Before my better judgment kicked in, I was drowsily climbing the stairs to the third floor, then tiptoeing down the hallway to the wing that held the consort suite and Ethan's rooms. I stood in front of the double doors to his apartment for just a moment before pressing my palm to the door and my forehead to the cool wood. God, I missed him. Jonah's kiss might have been glorious for that one moment of oblivion, but its wake was so much worse, miring me in thoughts of Ethan. Without warning, the door slipped open. I stood up again, heart pounding. I hadn't been in his rooms since the night he'd been killed. Some of his personal effects had been boxed up, but the rooms had otherwise been closed off. Frank had chosen other quarters, and Malik and his wife had remained in their own. I'd avoided Ethan's apartment altogether, thinking it was better to go cold turkey than become a phantom, haunting his rooms to foster the memories. But tonight, after lightning and fairy queens and kisses and guns, I needed a different kind of oblivion. I pushed the door open farther and walked inside. For a moment, I just stood in the doorway, eyes closed, drinking in the familiar scent. His sharp, clean cologne was giving away to the sense of cleaning polish and dust, but it still lingered there, faint and fresh, like the whispers of a ghost. I opened my eyes, closed the door behind me, and surveyed the room. It was nicely decorated, with expensive European furniture and furnishings more like a boutique hotel than the rooms of a master vampire. I walked across the sitting room to the second set of double doors. These led into Ethan's bedroom. The sun now above the horizon. I walked inside and caught the lingering scent of him again. Before I could think better of it, my shoes and jacket were on the floor and I was crawling into his bed. Tears spilling from the familiar sensation of the linens and the scent of him that filled them. I thought of the few times we'd made love, the tenuousness and joy of it, and the quirky, teasing smile he'd given me when he'd been pleased with something I'd done, or something he'd done to me. His eyes were so brilliantly green, his mouth perfection, his body as finely hewn as any marble statue. Wrapped in the scent of him, I smiled and savored the memories. There, in his bed, in his darkened rooms, I fell asleep. We were in a casino, surrounded by a cacophony of electric chirps and flashing lights, jostled by a parade of smiling waitresses with trays of drinks in short glasses. I sat in front of a slot machine with dials that spun in random increments, occasionally slowing to showcase a single image, a stake, a raindrop, a curl of fire. Ethan stood beside me, a gold coin between his thumb and index finger. It spun slowly on its axis, the light catching each rotation like a gold-edged strobe light. Two sides of the coin, he said, heads and tails, wrong and right, good and evil. He lifted his gaze to me. 
We all have choices, don't we? Choices? Between bravery or cowardice, he suggested. Ambition or contentment? I guess so. Which choice will you make, Merritt? I knew he meant something important, something heavy, but I couldn't tell what it was. What choice do I have to make? With a flick of his thumb, he popped the coin into the air. The ceiling seemed to rise as the coin flew upward, so that if gravity hadn't worked its peculiar magic, the coin might have lifted forever, never touching the ceiling. Over and over it flipped, heads and tails and heads again, catching the light with each rotation. Disappearing, Ethan said. I watched the coin grow smaller in the distance, rising to infinity. It isn't disappearing, I told him. It's still there. It's still turning. Not the coin. Me. The soft fear in his voice drew my eyes back to him. He was staring at his hands, now palm up in front of him. Having thrown the coin in the air, Ethan was beginning to fade, the tips of his fingers dissolving into ash that fell into the psychotically patterned carpet below us. What's happening to you? I couldn't do anything but stare as his fingers disappeared one millimeter at a time. Instead of screaming in horror or trying to stop it, I just gazed with clinical fascination, watching my lover being slowly erased into nothingness. I made my choice. I chose you. Frantically, fear rising in my gut, I shook my head. How do I stop it? I don't think you can. It's natural, isn't it, that we all devolve to ashes, to dust, and we're put away again? His attention was suddenly drawn away. He looked up and away at something across the room, his gaze widening farther. Ethan? His eyes snapped back to mine. It's too dangerous. Don't let them do it, Merritt. Do what? They'll take advantage. I think they're trying now. He looked down at his hands, now halfway turned to ash. I think that's where I'm going. Ethan, I don't understand. I'm only ashes, he said. He looked at me again, and I felt my own panic finally rising at the fear, the honest-to-God fear in his eyes. Ethan. Without warning, the disintegration accelerated, and he began to slip completely away his last move the screaming of my name. Merritt! I jolted awake in a cold sweat and a tangle of Ethan's blankets, dread sitting low in my stomach. It took a few moments to adjust to being awake again, to remember that it had only been a dream, that the horror wasn't real, but that he was still gone. The nightmares were coming faster now, no doubt the result of the stress I was feeling. I hadn't solved the problem yet, and there were potentially two more elemental dangers, perhaps the biggest dangers, lurking out there, earth and fire. God forbid I could figure something out before the city burned. When my heart slowed again, I untangled myself from the blankets and walked to the bedroom window. The automatic shutters that covered it during the day had already lifted revealing a gloriously dark sky, a couple of stars peeking through. I closed my eyes in relief. The sky was back to normal, and that probably meant the lake and river were as well. If Claudia and Catcher had been right, that the magic was elemental and following a kind of pattern, the reprieve would only be temporary. We'd seen air and water. Earth and fire couldn't be far behind but even a temporary reprieve would take some of the heat off us. I returned to my room, with Tate on my agenda and a message from Catcher confirming our second meeting. I showered and dressed in my leathers. I wasn't trying to impress Tate with my business acumen tonight. This was about fixing supernatural problems. The bit of worry wood, of course, was back in my pocket. Jonah, on the other hand, hadn't called. That bothered me a little. I hoped he wasn't going to avoid me because I'd rebuffed him. We were a green team, but a good one, 
and while I was beginning to learn that I could stand Sentinel on my own, I'd have much rather done it with a partner. Thinking Misery loved company, I dialed up Mallory. It took five rings before she answered, and even then she wasn't thrilled about it. Kind of in the middle of something. Then don't answer the phone next time, I joked, but the comment still stung. Sorry, she said, and it sounded like she meant it. I'm just... every exam gets a little worse, you know? And then I'm crazy tired, and I'm nearing the end of my rope. I just want this entire process to be over. I don't even care if I pass. I just want it done. I could hear the exhaustion in her voice and in the speed of her words. It wouldn't surprise me to learn she'd been downing energy drinks. I hear you, I said. I've got an errand to run. But would you be up for a breather afterward? I start my next exam in a few minutes. That sucks. Tell me about it. And to add insult to injury, Catcher's being a gigantic pain in the ass right now. I don't think he has any idea of the stress I'm going through. Her voice was testy, and I wondered if any of us knew the stress she was going through, other than Simon, who seemed to be directing it. And while I had her on the phone, Hey, I know you're in a hurry, but is there anything you can tell me about what's going on in the city right now with the lake and sky? I understand it's magic tied to the four elements, water, air, earth, and fire. Is that anything you've learned about? Her response was fast and furious. Jesus, Merritt, how many times now have you wondered if the city's problems come back to sorcerers? You did it with the drugs as well. I wonder about a lot of things, I said, reminding myself of the stress she was under. It's my job to wonder about the possibilities and then go figure out the truth. Oh, so were possibilities? I had no idea why we were arguing. I certainly hadn't accused her of anything. Was she lashing out at me because she'd thought the same thing, or because she was stressed? It's not like I'm out there just randomly making mischief, she said, before I could respond, or researching random pieces of magic. I'm taking exams, Merritt. Since when was city trauma a random piece of magic? The comment was irritating but I stayed calm. I know you are, but I'm not accusing you of anything. But there's some kind of magic at work here that I don't understand. I just thought maybe you would. You know what I know about merit? I know about sigils and califixes and magical algorithms and seeing auras. That's what I know about. You know what? I told her, forcing myself to remain calm. I'm going to let you go so you can get back to studying, okay? Maybe that's a good idea, and maybe you should hold off on the phone calls and the accusations until my exams are done. The phone went dead, leaving me wild-eyed and flustered and completely at a loss for words. Lindsay picked that moment to pop her head into my room. Breakfast? I held up the phone. Mallory just hung up on me. Lindsay frowned, stepped inside, and shut the door behind her. What did you do? Nothing. I mean, I did ask her if she knew anything about the lake and the sky, but nothing other than that. Lindsay whistled. Way to play it smooth. It was a legitimate question, and she's one of only three people in town who would know. True. I really don't have a dog in this fight. I just like not being the one getting into relationship trouble for once. That comment suggested it was going to be followed by details I didn't want to hear. But it also sounded like a cry for help. What did you do? She didn't waste any time. Long story short, relationships are hard. I don't fight fair, and I'm the messiest person he knows. I grimaced and agreed with him about the first and last things. Her room was a riot of stuff, and not in a stuff tidily arranged in those identical wicker baskets people put on bookshelves way. You don't fight fair? Her shoulders slumped. I might make references to breaking up when we fight. Yikes. 
Yeah, it's just I've never really done this for real, you know. Not a relationship this serious. Sometimes I just feel like there's all this fear bottled up, and it has to go somewhere. I convince myself this isn't going to last. He loves you. I know, but he might stop someday, and someday he might be gone. And then where am I? I'm all wrapped up in a boy, and I can't untangle myself. She fell back on the bed. I'm tired. I'm overworked. I'm being forcibly underfed. I'm stressed, and I have a boyfriend, a boyfriend merit, with his own issues. And the only thing I want to do is gorge on ice cream. And let's face it, the only problem that's going to solve is the "Hey, my pants are too loose" problem. And that's not a problem I have right now. She stood up and pooched out her belly, her tiny. It's really just skin belly. Really? I asked her, my voice dry as toast. It's just, I never used to be this girl. I was Lindsay, Cadogan House guard and all around hot shit. I was on the cover of the Chicago Voice Weekly for Christ's sake. I knew I looked good, and now I'm worrying about how my hair looks and whether these jeans look fan fucking tastic. They really do. They should. They cost two hundred bucks for jeans. They're butt lifting. To prove a point, she turned and gave me a pin-up worthy pose. But I wasn't impressed. They're jeans. They're made of the same butt lifting denim as the rest of the jeans in the world. If they were Pumas, you wouldn't be complaining about the price. She had a point. Continue. I magnanimously offered. The point is, I didn't used to worry about this stuff. I cared, but I didn't worry about it. I didn't worry about what this boy would think of me because I didn't care what this boy thought of me, you know. And now, she shook her head as if disgusted with herself. Now you think about other people instead of yourself. The narrowing of her eyes was the last thing I saw before the pillow smacked me in the face. Ow! I instinctively said, putting a hand on my cheek. Even if I did deserve that, ow! You take my point. I take your point, but maybe it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's not so much that you're becoming uber neurotic or anything. You like Luke, and you want him to like you back. You want to be validated. I guess. So focus on the Luke part instead of the Lindsay part. I mean, he's probably doing the same thing, wondering if his boots are shined up enough, or whatever cowboy vampire types worry about. Chaps, as we have discussed, they frequently worry about chaps. I pressed my fingers over my eyes. You know, I moved out of Mallory's house just so I could avoid conversations like this. No, you moved out of Mallory's house so you could avoid seeing Catcher in boxer briefs, which frankly is crazy. That boy is hella delicious. I saw him naked more than I saw him in boxer briefs, and pretty or not, sometimes I just want to sit down with my leftover Chinese without his naked ass strolling through my kitchen. Lindsay chortled and sat down again. So really, it's a hygiene issue. It really is. We were quiet for a moment. Is he worth it? I finally asked. What do you mean? I remembered the night I'd gone to Ethan, finally sure he was willing to accept me for who I was and that I could do the same for him. There'd been no doubt then, no fear, just acceptance of the risk that I was taking and the confidence that he was worth it, that we would have been worth it. It had taken time for me to get there, and for Ethan to be ready for a relationship. Maybe if we'd gotten there earlier, we'd have had more time together. But there was no point in ruining that now. He was gone, except in my dreams, and those were becoming too traumatic to want to relive. I think I finally said, "You reach a point where you're willing to take that chance, where you know you still might get hurt in the long run." But you decide it's worth it, and if I never get there, then you're honest with him.
But don't let fear make the decision. Make the decision based on who he is and who you are when you're with him. Or who he helps you to be. She nodded, a tear slipping from her eye. I had the sudden sense the decision would come easier and faster than she might have imagined. You'll be fine, I pronounced, then gave her a sideways hug. He loves you, and you love him, and someday, if we're lucky, things will get back to normal around here. She crossed one leg over another. What would that be like, even? You tell me. I assume it's what life was like before Selena outed the houses. Ah, yes, the halcyon days of... God, those days were pretty dull, now that I think of it. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Grass is greener, she agreed, then slid me a glance. Now that we've worked through my relationship issues, are you ready to talk about Jonah? What I wanted to do was nip that conversation in the bud. There's nothing to talk about. Look, she said, her tone softening. I'm not saying now is the time for you to find an eternity partner, but maybe it's time for you to consider considering someone, a friend, a lover, a friend with benefits. She bumped my shoulder playfully. Jonah is like, I mean, Jesus merit. He's crazy beautiful, smart. He's got the trust of his entire house, and he appreciates you. He's not Ethan. That's not fair. There was no Ethan before him, and there will be no Ethan after him. But Ethan's gone. I'm not saying you forget he existed. I'm just saying eternity is a long time. And maybe you could consider the possibility that there are other people who could become part of your life if you let them. We sat there quietly for a moment. He kissed me. Lindsay offered up a dolphin-worthy squeal. I knew he would. How was it? The kiss? Great. My regret after the fact? Less enjoyable. Eek, she said. What did you do? I kind of bailed on him. I thought putting it into the form of a question would make it sound a little less bad. Maybe not surprisingly, it didn't. Bad form, Sentinel. Bad form. You still on speaking terms? Possibly not, but that'll change. It has to, since he's the only partner I've got at the moment. True dat. Times are tough. Guards and partners are in short supply, and humans are whiny little babies. I mean, we've been here as long as they have. You want to bet the murder rate among humans is a lot higher than it is among vampires? We are not the ones causing this city's issues. She stood up and moved her hands down in front of her body, blowing out a breath as she did it. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm also really hungry. You ready for breakfast? I shook my head. I don't have time. I'm visiting the mayor. She whistled low. Again? Are you that hard up for a date? Har har. I think he might have information about what's going on. I filled her in on my lemon and sugar theory. Unlike Catcher, she thought there was merit to the idea, but that didn't deter her from her goal. Mare or not, even vampires have to eat. She tapped a finger against her head. Empathic, remember? I can feel how hungry you are. And if you're going to figure out what the hell is going on here, you need to be ready for it. You can't put off food just because you're tired. It will only make you tireder. I didn't disagree that she had a point, but I wanted this matter done sooner rather than later. On the other hand... I did have a tendency to run myself until I was quite literally sick of it, until I was in bed for a week with a virus that knocked me completely on my ass. A week of no sleep, slamming down junk food, and stress tended to do that to a girl. I wasn't sure if vamps could get colds, but it probably wouldn't be very responsible of me to test that theory now. We walked downstairs and moved into the cafeteria line. Unfortunately, Juliet and Margot had been right about Frank's new nutritional choices. Free-range eggs, 
turkey bacon, organic fruit salad, and a grain-heavy gruel that looked like it would have been served in Little Orphan Annie's orphanage. Ugh, I remarked, but scooped up eggs and fruit and grabbed a drink box of blood. We took our food to a table and were quickly joined by Margot and Catherine, another novitiate with a wicked sense of humor and a fabulous singing voice. So it's been a really freaky week. How's it going out there? Margot asked, picking through her bowl of fruit. I've been beating the streets, but I'm not sure I'm making progress. That's all you can do, Margot said, pointing at me with a cantaloupe-laden fork. Besides, things are back to normal for now. Maybe they'll stay that way. I wouldn't bet on it, but I nodded my agreement. Margot gave me a sly look. I hear you're working with Jonah the captain of the Grey House Guards. Any details you want to pass along? I felt my cheeks warm. Not really, I said, hoping Lindsay wasn't going to spill the beans about the kiss. I was proud. She chewed her muffin with obvious deliberation and kept quiet. We're just working together. And what's on your agenda for the day? Catherine asked. I'm meeting with the mayor, actually. Well, the former mayor. You think he turned the sky and river? Margot wondered. I think information keeps pointing in his direction. Have you talked to Cabot lately? Lindsay asked. I shook my head, my stomach grumbling sympathetically at the mention of his name. Not since he sent us to talk to the fairies. Probably figured fairy side was an easier way to get rid of you, Catherine grumbled. Wouldn't surprise me. I agreed. What's he done now? Now he's got a wild hair about our skills. Strat, fizz, psych. He says he's reviewing our files to ensure we've been appropriately categorized. He's assessing whether or not we're threats, I muttered. And that's probably my fault. When we met, I told him I was a strong fizz. He probably didn't like the reminder that we're actually competent out here in Cadogan House. He is a piece of work, Margot agreed, and we want to escape him for a few hours. She pointed at me with her fork. What's your schedule tonight? We're thinking about an evil dead and army of darkness marathon. I blinked, like the Bruce Campbell movies? The table went silent. Show a little respect, Merritt, Lindsay said with more than a little defense. Have you ever been overtaken by a Kandarian demon? I glanced among them all, trying to ferret out whether they were joking or I had stepped into some kind of Bruce Campbell cult. Not in the last few hours. Yeah, well, it's not really funny, is it? With the crazy eyes and uncontrollable limbs? She shivered, and I honestly couldn't tell if she was serious. You're joking, right? I quietly asked. I mean, I thought you were joking, but some pretty weird stuff goes on in Katagun, and I haven't read the entire canon yet, so maybe I just missed the Kandarian demon chapter? She managed a good fifteen seconds more before she couldn't hold in the snort. Oh my god, totally. But I almost didn't make it. Seriously, though, I love the flicks. You in? I reached out and punched her a few times in the arm while the rest of the table chortled. I'll let you know, I said. You do that. Oh, she exclaimed. I just felt a pretty solid hint of Cabot irritation. She tapped her forehead again, which was apparently international code for, I've got empathic powers and I know how to use them. In case he's looking for an outlet for his obsessions, she said. You might want to take that breakfast to go. I heard he made three novitiates cry yesterday. She didn't have to tell me twice. I nodded and grabbed my drink box, then hopped up. If he calls an assembly to announce he's leaving Chicago, save me a seat. You'll be the first we call, Lindsay promised, and I took her at her word. Chapter 14 Mayoral Privilege when I was dressed, fed, and katanaed, I walked back to the front of the house. I was on my way to Malik's office, 
I thought I'd give him a direct report. When I heard shouting, I didn't like the idea of shouting in the vicinity of my master, so I put a hand on my katana to keep it balanced and ran down the hall. I found Luke and Malik in his office. The door was open, and they stood in the middle of the room, both with arms crossed. Their expressions were blank as they listened to a news report from a very expensive stereo. Both looked over and offered a nod of acknowledgement. And this man, said the woman on the radio, whom I guessed was the mayor. This colleague of mine was accosted by vampires on the street, and then he was questioned by the police as if he was to blame for it. What is this city coming to if these are the kinds of shenanigans playing out on our streets right now? McKetrick, I closed my eyes ruefully, not just because he had been released, and so much for that plan, but because I'd played right into his hand. Granted, I was guilty of only walking down the street and defending myself, but he had friends in high places, and his version made a much more interesting headline. Kowalczyk started up again. I am, however, very happy to announce that by the end of the evening, supernatural registration will be law. By the end of the night, we'll have the authority to track the location of supernaturals across the city, and they will no longer be able to surprise citizens on the street. With a sickened expression, Malik reached over and flipped off the radio. That woman is a piece of goddamned work, Luke spat out. Who does she think she is? And how stupid is she that she believes McKetrick? He blew out a breath and linked his hands atop his head. She's a fascist with an ache to be president, and she isn't going to stop. Not while there are headlines to be made, Malik agreed. He looked at me. Kelly told me what actually went down, that you arranged for Catcher to pick him up. I'm hopeful he at least got some useful information before the release. I'm going back to visit Tate. Catcher should be there, and I'll ask for the details. You're thinking Tate is in play? Luke asked. I think, at a minimum, he knows what's going on. I told them about the old magic Claudia had mentioned, and the sense of lemon and sugar that Catcher hadn't been convinced were meaningful. But that didn't seem to faze Malik. You stand sentinel of this house for a reason, Merritt. He trusted you. I trust you. Luke trusts you. Your instincts are good. Follow them where they lead, and we will support you whatever the result. He may have taken the reins of the house in regrettable circumstances, but there was no doubt he was a master. The second verse of Getting to Tate was pretty much the same as the first except for the part about carefully skirting the men with large guns who stood in front of the house. The members of the National Guard looked more than capable of keeping the screaming protesters at bay. Problem was, if McKetrick had convinced the mayor of the third biggest city in the country that vampires were evil, could they be convinced as well? I drove toward the lake and met Catcher at the factory gate. He looked exhausted and I wasn't sure if the problems in the city or his sorceress were responsible for the bloodshot eyes. I hear McKetrick's back on the street. I heard the broadcast, he grumbled. We didn't have a secure facility for interrogation. We called Jacobs, who hauled him in. He questioned him through the night. Let us sit in. That explained the exhaustion, I thought. At least until the mayor called and Jacobs had to let him go. I assumed he trotted down to her office, and they concocted the story. Did you get anything out of him? Not much, but I'm not sure he has much to hide. McKetrick's pretty clear about his position on vampires. Genocide's a harsh word, but I wouldn't put it past him. Let's hope Kowalczyk is smart enough not to buy in. I don't suppose he gave up the location of his facility. He did not, but he gave up his fingerprints and a little DNA and we got another set from the gun you brought in. That gives us something to work with if he starts making trouble. I suppose that's something, I conceded, but wondered if that data had been worth the risk. McKetrick was going to be pissed, 
and the episode was only going to tie McKetrick and Kowalczyk closer together. She'd rescued him, and that wasn't going to be something either one of them forgot. He pulled to a stop in front of the building, and I realized uniform CPD guards, not fairies, were guarding it. This is a bad idea, I quietly said, surveying the officers, who all looked like rookies just out of training, and undoubtedly had no defenses against whatever magic Tate wielded. They're the reason we were able to get in at all, Catcher said. Chuck served with one of their grandfathers, and he called in a favor. The boys in blue are loyal to each other. Maybe so, I said, but these kids are no match for Tate. He was able to manipulate Selena, and she's just as stubborn and resilient as they come. There's no other choice, he said. Chuck had to fight to keep Tate separated from the rest of the prison population. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure if it's better or worse that Tate's no longer mayor. He started off strong enough, opened the ombud's office. He was a real supporter of Chuck. Until he started manufacturing drugs and attempting to control vampires? There is that, Catcher agreed. I'm not saying those were good deeds. I just think they're anomalies in the bigger scheme of Tate. I didn't disagree the change was odd, but I thought it revealed true colors Tate hadn't been able to hide any longer. Scheme, I thought, was the key word. I hopped out of the cart, offered up my weapons, then glanced back at Catcher. You're staying here? He'd already pulled out a book and was flipping through the pages. Right here waiting. Just like the song, I'm scanning the order's annals for any evidence of whether anything like this has happened before, including whether Tate might be involved. With a frown, he absently scratched the back of his head. I'm hoping if I can find that kind of entry, I can backtrack and figure out what kind of magic was behind it. Given his obvious exhaustion and tireless efforts, I managed not to make a juvenile joke about the annals of an organization with the acronym U-A-S-S. That sounds perfectly reasonable. We'll see, he grumbled in response, but he was already scanning the pages. I headed for the door. The kid in uniform offered me a salute, then opened the door to the building. A second uniform stood point at the steel door that led into the office. Ma'am? Be careful in there, he said, and when I assured him I would, open the door and let me inside. It immediately slammed shut behind me. I jumped a little, which wasn't exactly the brave facade I'd hoped to put on for this meeting. I don't bite, ballerina, Tate cannily said. In his orange jumpsuit, he was seated at the aluminum table again. Since he clearly wasn't going to use my name, I didn't bother to correct him. I'd also already decided it was useless to play games with a liar. So I sat down across from him and got down to business. Are you the one manipulating the city right now? He looked back at me, head slightly tilted, his expression inscrutable. I don't know what you're talking about. His tone was equally opaque. I couldn't tell if he was being sarcastic or if he was truly surprised by the question. I decided there was no point in not putting all my cards on the table, not when the city was at stake. The lake went dead. The sky turned red. I understand we're seeing elemental magic, symptoms that are popping up because the city is unbalanced. We've seen water and air so far. Fire and earth could be next. And? I paused picking up a tone to offer up my theory. I opted for Ethan's slyer-than-thou voice. It's the strangest thing, Tate. Whenever I'm in your presence, I smell lemon and sugar, like cookies baking. His expression stayed flat, but his pupils had narrowed just a smidge. I was on to something. Yesterday, while the sky was red, it rained, and I smelled the same thing. I linked my hands together on the table and leaned forward. I know you're doing this, and you're going to tell me how to stop it, or we're going to go around, right here, right now. 
Okay, I might have gone a bit overboard on the last bit, but not just because I had no weapons and wasn't entirely sure what he could do. But Tate ignored the bravado. If I'm the maker of these events, how exactly did I arrange them from my humble abode? I hadn't exactly gotten to that part. He made a sound of disdain. You hadn't gotten to any part. You could hardly be more wrong, and that bodes as poorly for the city as anything else. It is not in my nature to produce that kind of magic. What are you? I asked him. If this magic isn't mine, why does it matter? How could it possibly not matter? Tate frowned and shuffled in his chair. Humans have an irritating desire to group their fellow men and women into categories, to give them a type, and to give the type a name, so that by definition they are otherwise. They are not who we are. Frankly, I find the endeavor exhausting. I am what I am, just as you are what you are. A confession from Tate of his magical identity and his responsibility for the water and sky would have been nice, but I knew when to push and when to listen, and even if he wasn't going to confess, he seemed to honestly believe he understood what was happening. That was definitely worth my time. If you didn't have anything to do with this, then tell me who did. Explain to me what's happening. Slowly, a smile curved his lips. Now this is interesting. You asking me for information. For a favor, as it were. It's not a favor if I'm helping save the city you swore an oath to protect. Oaths are overrated. You've sworn them as well, did you not? To protect your house. I did, and I have. I growled out. He hadn't expressly suggested that I'd broken my oaths presumably by failing to protect Ethan, but it rode beneath his words. Hmm, he noncommittally said. And if I was to give you this information, what's my incentive, my payment, my boon, the public good? He laughed heartily. You amuse me greatly, ballerina. You really do. And while I enjoy Chicago, there are plenty of cities in the world. Saving this one is hardly incentive enough for the kind of information you're talking about. It wasn't surprising that he wanted payment for the information, but I didn't want to offer up a prize without a little negotiation. I owe you nothing, I told him. If anything, you owe me. You're responsible for my master's death. And the death of your enemy, he pointed out. He leaned forward over the table hands flat on the tabletop, and stared at me like I was the subject of his psychological experiment, which I probably was. Does it bother you that you've killed? That a life was extinguished by your hand? Don't take the bait, I reminded myself. Does it bother you that you were the true cause of her death? Let's not get into a philosophical discussion about causation. Then let's agree that you owe me one, and you can tell me what you know. Interesting tactic, but no. Probably not surprising that his questionable ethics didn't prompt him to help me out of his own accord. What do you want? What do you have? I thought about the question. Honestly, I didn't have much. My dagger and sword were outside with Catcher. I didn't have much else of value beyond the family pearls in my room and the signed baseball Ethan had given me, and I wasn't giving those up. While I considered the question, I absently touched the Katagun medal around my neck. Tate's eyes widened at the move. That would be an interesting prize. Instinctively, I cupped my fingers around it. His expression was guarded, but clearly sincere. I wasn't sure about his motivation, but unlike the fairies, I didn't think his interest was in the gold. Did the metal have magical properties? I'd never thought to ask. Regardless, it was precious to me. There's no way in hell you're getting this. Then we have nothing to talk about. I recalled the first time I'd made a bargain with the supernatural creature. 
How about I owe you a favor, a boon of some kind? That offer had worked with Morgan Greer, now master of Navarre House, but Tate didn't seem impressed with it. You're a vampire. You could renege on your offer. I would never, I said, but since there was no telling the kind of favor Tate would extract, I silently admitted there was a possibility I wouldn't go through with it. Tate sat back. We're done here. You can solve this problem on your own. Perhaps one of your friends could help you. They're sorcerers, no. They should be able to explain things to you. Should be able, but we're at a loss, I thought. I touched the pendant again, running my fingertip across the engraved letters. The metal had been mine since I was commended into the house, promoted from initiate to novitiate vampire and given the position of sentinel. Ethan had clasped the metal around my neck. Since his death, I'd rarely removed it. But the problems facing Chicago and its supernaturals were bigger than me or Ethan or a small bit of gold. So I relented. Without a word to Tate, although I could feel his smug satisfaction from across the table, I unclasped the metal and let it fall into my hand. Tate held out his hand to receive it, but I shook my head. Information first, I told him. Prize later. I had no idea you were so tenacious. I learned from the best, I said, smiling sweetly. Get on with it. Tate considered the bargain for a moment and finally nodded. Fine. The deal is struck, but as you might imagine, I don't get visitors often. I'm taking the long road. Besides, you are clearly woefully undereducated about the supernatural world. I couldn't fight back a sigh. Getting a lengthy history lecture from Tate wasn't high on my list of things to accomplish tonight. Saving the city was actually number one on that list. On the other hand, he was probably right. I was undereducated. While he may have planned to take the long road, he didn't waste a moment getting comfortable in his chair and imparting his wisdom. Magic wasn't born on the eve of vampires' creation, he lectured. It existed for millennia on this plane and others. Good and evil live together in relationship slightly more, shall we say, symbiotic than this one. They were partners, neither better than the other, coexisting in peace. There was a certain justice in the world. Magic was unified, dark and light, good and evil. The distinctions didn't exist. Magic only was. Neither moral or immoral, but amoral as it was meant to be. And then one red-letter day, humans decided evil wasn't merely the other side of the coin. It was wrong, bad. Not the other half of good, but its opposite. It's apotheosis. Tate drew a square on the tabletop with a finger. The evil was deemed a contamination. It was drawn from good, separated. Mallory had once told me that black magic was like a second four-quadrant grid that lay above the four keys. It sounded like her explanation had been pretty accurate. How was the magic separated, I wondered. Carefully, he said. There were a number of iterations. Gods were divided into two halves. One moral, one immoral. Sides were taken, and angels were deemed true or fallen. Most important, some would say evil was placed into a vessel that would contain it. It was parceled out only to a few who would seek to wield it. What was the vessel? It's called the Maleficium. So what does this have to do with the city? I've been told we're seeing effects in the lake and sky because the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, are unbalanced. Like I mentioned, that's a typical human instinct to create categories to explain the world and blame the unfamiliar on a disruption in the categories. But categories don't explain things. They describe them. Have you heard the myth of the four keys? The four divisions of magic? Yeah, but I've never heard them referred to as a myth. Tate rolled his eyes. 
That's because sorcerers aren't honest with themselves. Every categorization of magic, by keys, by elements, by astrological signs, whatever, is just a way of ordering the universe for purposes of their practice. Each sect creates its own divisions and distributes magical properties into those divisions. But the divisions don't matter. I found that revelation to be surprisingly disappointing, that the philosophy of magic Catcher had imparted to me those months ago wasn't quite accurate, or at least it was only one of the many half-accurate ideas. The point, Merit, is not that the magical systems are incorrect, but that they simply aren't important. Then what is? The distinction between dark and light. He placed a hand flat on the table. Assume this hand is the entire world of magic. He spread his fingers. Call each finger a key, an element, a drawer, what have you. The name doesn't matter. The point is, however you describe the categories, the categories are all part of a single system. Sure, I said with a nod. Now imagine the system is ripped in two by those who decided good and evil were anathema to each other. His left hand flat on the table, he placed his right hand palm down a few inches above it. Each hand is now half of the magic in the world. The world continues to function as we know it only while those two layers remain in balance. My thoughts stopped whirling chaotically and fell into order. Which is why the lake stopped moving and the sky turned red, because the natural laws are askew. I wouldn't say askew. I would say undergoing reorganization. So the nymphs, the siren, the fairies, they truly have nothing to do with it? Bit players, at best. I sighed, regrouped, and kept going. Why would things become unbalanced? Because light and dark magic are being blended together. Because the separations between them have been violated. There are a variety of reasons, I suppose, to employ dark magic. Murder, binding someone to service, the creation of a familiar. Prophecy for those who don't have the gift. Conjuring demons, communing with otherworldly creatures. Then who's doing it, and how do I fix it? How do you fix it? He barked out a laugh. You don't fix it. It's not a screw that needs tightening. It simply is. Some would say it's a return to the original world, the first world, that which existed and should exist again. There was a self-satisfied gleam in his eyes that suggested he was looking forward to that day. It seemed clear he thought the world was ready for change. Wouldn't it be a return to war, I wondered, to Armageddon? He clucked his tongue. That's such a naive view. Good and evil existed together for eons before humans, or vampires for that matter, came into being. Don't knock what you don't understand. I ignored the sass. And the maleficium? Where can I find it? He sat back in his chair and threw an arm over the back. Now, now, ballerina. I can't give away all my secrets, can I? Are you using the maleficium to make magic of your own? To bring about that new world order? He smiled at me through half-lidded eyes. Would I do such a thing? Yes, and you'd lie about it. He tilted his head to the side in obvious interest. After all I've just given you, you accuse me of dishonesty. You've lied your entire life, that you had the city's welfare at heart, that you were trying to help vampires, that you were human. Yes, well, amorality was easier before evil intent was ascribed to it. I rolled my eyes. If you didn't have anything to do with it, why did the fairies think old magic is involved? And why did the city smell like lemon and sugar after it rained? Just because I didn't make the magic doesn't mean I can't enjoy it. The maleficium is old magic. The recombination of good and evil leaves its mark on the natural world the water and sky. It also leaves its mark on the wind, in the latent magic in the air. I can't be faulted for wanting to sample it, can I? How can you sample airborne magic from across town? 
There is more to the universe, Horatio, than what you can see or believe to be true. I'm aware, I dryly said. The point is, magic doesn't need a freeway. If you don't have the Maleficium, who does? The Order maintains possession of it, guards it, if you will. My stomach churned with butterflies. I was going to have to go back to Catcher and accuse a sorcerer of screwing with the Maleficium. Yeah, maybe Mallory was distorting the natural world in her fifteen minutes of free time each day. Well, regardless of whether I liked his answer, I couldn't fault him for not sticking to his word. I placed the medal on the table and slid it toward Tate. Without looking back, I rose from my chair and walked toward the door. Thank you for the prize, Tate said, and don't be a stranger. Frankly, I'd be fine if I never had to see him again, but I doubted I'd be that lucky. Chapter 15 Blackbird Catcher met me in the golf cart just outside the door. I climbed in and he took off for the gate. What happened to your medal? I traded it for some magic beans, I grouchily said. He gave a low whistle. Those better have been good beans. Jury's still out. Tate agrees the sky and earth issues are caused by a magical imbalance, basically someone mixing good and evil a little too liberally. He's not convinced the change wouldn't be a good idea. He mentioned the Maleficium. Do you know anything about it? Is there any chance he could have gotten it? Catcher's brow furrowed, but he shook his head. The Order has the Maleficium. It's in Nebraska, in the silo, under thirty feet of farmland, an Order lock and key. I'm sorry, I interrupted. The silo? Abandoned missile silo. Nebraska's in the middle of the country, so it's full of Cold War strategic defense munitions. You know, far enough away from the coasts that you could keep the important stuff there. If you say so, is it secure? Whatever else I might say about the order, and believe me, I have many choice words in mind. They would not allow the Maleficium to leave the silo. Tate just likes watching you squirm. The man is a total sadist. He succeeded, I said. I'm squirming. If he doesn't have the Maleficium, maybe he's working through someone else. Has he had any visitors? You're the only one we've allowed in. So much for that theory. Then by my estimation, here's what we're left with. He says he's not involved, and I tend to believe him. And last we talked, you did too. I braced myself. If it's not Tate... And if the Maleficium's involved, and if the Order has the Maleficium, I let him fill in the blank. It's not me or Mallory. I know, but that only leaves one person. Simon is the only person in Chicago who's officially associated with the Order. Wouldn't that also make him the only person in Chicago who has access to the Maleficium? Catcher didn't respond. What's the history with you and Simon? I asked. Catcher squealed the golf cart to a stop in front of the gate in a flurry of rocks and gravel. The problem, he said, isn't historical. We're past personal vendettas at this point. It's not a goddamn personal vendetta, Catcher yelled, slamming his fist into the cart's plastic dashboard. I wanted to protect her from this. I didn't want her dealing with order bullshit. Dealing with order politics. Dealing with order flunkies. She's freaking out. We're both exhausted. And he's in there with her, down there with her, every single day. God only knows what he's putting into her brain. Mallory would never be unfaithful, I quietly said. Unfaithful to our relationship? No, she wouldn't, he agreed. But there are lots of ways to be turned against someone, Merritt. If someone you loved was being brainwashed, what would you do about it? Brainwashed? That's putting it a little strongly, isn't it? Does she seem like the same person to you? She hadn't, actually, since she met Simon, which supported my theory that Simon was involved. One way or the other, Simon is the linchpin in this thing. If you can't stand to talk to him, then set up a meeting with me. 
Simon won't meet with the member of the house. The order won't allow it. There's a formal process that has to be followed just to make the request, which they won't grant. I've talked to him before. Casually. You're talking about making him answer to vampires about his actions. That's different. My patience with sorcerers, catcher included, was growing thin. I climbed out of the cart, then looked back at him. If I can't meet with him, then you do it. Catcher's jaw tightened. He tapped his fingers on the steering wheel, apparently ready for me to leave. At least I could do someone a favor. With another break in the action, since I was surely not going to interrogate Simon without Catcher as backup, I called Kelly and offered an update. I advised her about the Mall Officium and our new theory that reunification of good and evil was causing the city's problems. I also called Lindsay, who confirmed the Bruce Campbell movie-a-thon was underway. I didn't exactly have time for a movie, but I was stressed and tired, and I needed real food. If a movie was playing during the meal, so be it. With dinner in mind, I pulled over at a taco truck on the way back to Hyde Park and ordered as much as I could stuff into a single bag, which I thought was less likely to raise Frank's ire if I was caught sneaking junk food into the house. I drove back and slid into a parking spot, then walked back into the house past rhythmically chanting protesters and stoic men and women in uniform. The house was quiet when I walked in, only a few vampires milling about in the front rooms. There was kind of a solemnity in the house under Malik's rule, and I wasn't sure if that was because the house reflected his generally solemn personality, because vampires were still grieving, or because we were still under GP occupation. A mix of all three, maybe. Without my medal but with contraband, I hustled upstairs to Lindsay's third-floor room. I didn't bother knocking, but carefully opened the door. There were usually vamps spread out in every spare nook and cranny, and if you weren't careful, you inevitably banged someone on the head. The dark room was, as per usual, full of noise from Lindsay's Wii television and full of vampires. Lindsay, Margot, and Catherine had spots on the bed, and a slew of vamps I'd seen only in passing were packed onto the floor, maybe fifteen in all. That was certainly a violation of Tate's rule against assembling in groups larger than ten. Long live the revolution! I picked my way across the novitiates, distributing paper-wrapped tacos like a culinary Santa Claus, and eventually stopping in a small empty spot in a far corner of the room. The vamp beside me smiled and offered one of her pillows, which I took with a whispered, Thanks. One campy horror movie later, I reached two conclusions. One, I loved my friends. Two, I still didn't get it. We'd just cleared the room of taco wrappings and vampires when my and Lindsay's beepers simultaneously erupted. I pulled mine off and checked the screen. Training room, it read, with a dress for training follow-up. I looked up at Lindsay. What's this about? I'm sure Frankenfurter has some vital lesson he wants to teach us. Sadly, Frankenfurter does not ask us for advice, I said. And I totally support the use of Frankenfurter. I knew you would, she said, heading for her bathroom door. Probably to go change into our required yoga pants. He could learn a lot from two hip, big city vamps. Did you just cast your own sitcom? I believe I did, yeah. I'm some witty dialogue and an after-school special away from an Emmy. You know, in case this vampire guard thing doesn't work out. I offered a sound of agreement and walked to the door so I could change clothes. Frank's still here, I pointed out. There's probably a good chance this guard thing won't work out for either of us. It said a lot that she didn't disagree with me. Once clothed in a black sports bra and yoga pants, I gathered together with Lindsay, Juliet, and Kelly in the sparring room. We stood barefoot at the edges of the mats, waiting for our call to arms, 
or whatever Frank had in store. He stood in the middle of the room, in the middle of the mats, still in a suit and fancy shoes. Lindsay quietly clucked her tongue. Luke is not going to be thrilled Frankenfurter's wearing shoes on his tatami mats. No, I whispered in agreement. That is not going to go over well. Not that he can do anything about it. Malik and Luke stood together on the other side of the room, irritated magic seeping from their corner. The balcony that ringed the room was filling with house vampires, their expressions ranging from curious to concerned. They clearly didn't trust Frank any more than we did. When the balcony was full, Frank loudly cleared his throat, stared daggers at the vampires until everyone was seated. Then he lowered his gaze to the four of us. I have determined it is in the best interests of the house that your semi-annual physical testing be held tonight. Stunned silence descended over the room, at least until the whispering started. The novitiate's quiet comments echoed my own. This wasn't the time to take the house guards out of commission for a test. And even if we failed, who was going to replace us? This had all the markings of an attempt to charge us as incompetent, or make me look worse than Frank already imagined I was. Luke was the first to speak aloud. You want to give them a test? This is ridiculous. They need to be outside defending the house, not dealing with bureaucratic nonsense. Fortunately, Frank said, I did not ask for, nor do I require, your opinion. As the GP has repeatedly attempted to drill into its house, this house and its operation is your primary, and only, concern. The complications of human existence are not. As you and the GP are well aware, Luke spat back, the city is falling apart, one piece of real estate at a time. And you don't think we need to be worried about that? You don't think we need to be out there on the streets dealing with it? Luke? Malik said, putting a hand on Luke's arm. Not now. His words suggested Luke show respect for Frank, but his own emotions were clearly roiling. It was evident in the furrow of his brow, the tenseness in his posture, and the vibration of tense magic from his corner. The conflict Malik faced was obvious. To stand up for your guards and your second-in-command— or to obey the council responsible for your house's existence and the protection of your vampires. Sometimes you had to lose the battle to win the campaign. Mr. Cabot, Malik said into the tense silence. Continue. Frank nodded pompously, but the rest of the vampires took Malik at his word and immediately quieted. As I was saying... You will be tested and evaluated in various forms of physical fitness and endurance. If you refuse to participate, you will be stripped of your position in the house. If you fail, you will be stripped of your position in the house. The room went deathly silent, all of us shocked. He looked up and looked right at me. You're all rated very strong fizz. Let's see if those classifications hold true. Frank looked down at his watch. You will begin. This can't be for real, Kelly pleaded, but she was silenced by a withering glance from the narc. You will begin, Frank said again. Now. Testing a vampire's strength and endurance was tricky, especially if the vampires were guards of one of the nation's oldest vampire houses. We were obviously strong, fast, and flexible. We'd been trained in combat, both with and without swords, and we'd run our fair share of miles. We'd done thousands upon thousands of sit-ups and squats, push-ups and chin-ups. The four of us probably could have exercised into infinity. But Frank wasn't interested in infinity. Frank was interested in what we could do right now on half rations of blood, measured by a testing regimen probably created in the 1950s. Our strength was tested by throwing giant iron balls and weights across the Catagon grounds. One smashed window notwithstanding, they were really hard to aim. We managed to surpass his arbitrary milestones. 
Our flexibility and speed were tested with jump ropes that we were expected to use with ever faster repetitions. We belly crawled across the backyard, flipped gigantic truck tires he'd hauled in for the task, and ran back and forth sprints until our legs felt like dead weight. He ordered us into the pool, freezing in the November chill, and made us swim laps until our skin was milky white and our teeth chattered from the cold. We climbed out of the pool with soaked clothes and hair, steam rising from our bodies, and hatred of Frank growing in our hearts. Frank carried around a clipboard and made notes as we worked through his drills, his gaze disdainful, as if we were failing in every respect to meet whatever mental criteria he'd established. Not that that was surprising. He couldn't have honestly thought this was a good time to test the only remaining three and a half guards in Cadogan House. The house was peaceful only because we'd paid Claudia's minions to protect us, and it was a waste of time trying to prove a point he was never going to accept. Whether we passed or we failed, we still failed. But while the workout was exhausting, it was still just a workout. Painful, sure. Tiring, yes. But just as in a normal workout, you reached a point where you zoned into the rhythm. We were vampires, and strong ones, and that meant something. We were strong, fast, and flexible, whatever Frank's criticisms. And we weren't the only ones who thought so. Word of the test spread through the house. Slowly but surely, a trickle of Catagon vampires began to spill into the yard. They formed a protective circle around us as we worked, occasionally handing over blood boxes and bottles of water like marathon volunteers. We were belly crawling across the grass for the second time when Margot and Catherine popped through the edge of the crowd. We have something for you, Margot said, glancing around sneakily to locate Frank. Lindsay, her hair still wet and stringy from the pool and her face streaked with dirt,